Hello everyone, this is Asclepius with Echoes from the Caverns. Newscast dated September 5, 2014. Echoes from the Caverns is distributed by Sir Style Tackle and is a joint podcast created and run by Lord Baldrith, Asclepius and Sir Style Tackle. The background music by Stephen J. Goldman. Now, if anyone's wondering why they're not hearing Lord Baldrith's golden tones right now, it's because he is away on a well-deserved break and left me minding the shop. And just to make sure that I don't ruin it completely, Sir Style has very kindly found a couple of awesome guests for me. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Lord Juton, who was here a few weeks ago. He's come in to help me run the shop. Welcome, Lord Juton. Howdy, howdy. And also, not only but also, we have the one and only Joe Garrity, the founder of the Origin Museum. So welcome to you, Joe. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Hi, and it's great to have you both here. So how are you doing today? D- having a good week this week, guys? Doing good. I'm just waiting for Joe to say first. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a wonderful time. I'm excited. I really am. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, all right, so the program is, as you're aware, we run through the news of the week. It's actually a fairly short news release this week, Um, but we'll run through it quickly, and then we'll get into the business of discussion. So, update of the Avatar number 89. Would you believe that this game has been in development for 89 weeks? No. That's, That's sort of amazing. It is. Yeah, okay. And it's starting to look pretty awesome. Okay, so first item on the agenda, PAX vs. Dragon Con. And this was the release, of course. Did you have a chance, I suppose you didn't have a chance to play much, Lord Jouton? No, because uh, I was too busy being, actually being, being Dragon. at Dragon Con. That's right, yeah. Exactly. So in terms of uh, the news being light, I actually do have a couple of... Uh, uh, quotes from uh, Star and Richard that they shouldn't be lawyered on, but I do have some information from them. Oh, excellent. So, oh, yeah, so, yeah, I uh, harassed them. I had uh, breakfast with Star and I had, no, I had lunch with Star and then I had breakfast with Richard and Star the day after. Oh, and you're like rubbing elbows with the rich and famous now. This is great. I know, it was creepy the whole time. I wanted to go ahead and have a nervous breakdown, but, uh, I had a friend of mine there to calm me down because he wasn't he wasn't aware of who these people were until I name dropped Lord British and then he texted his dad and they were all freaking out. So, <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yep. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, so look, please feel free to jump in because that's fantastic. I, was, I saw the photo of you all at breakfast too. So did I. Yeah. yeah. It was. It was. Gener- it was. It was nice. Uh, I felt bad because they kept on offering to pay, and uh, wow. but they were genuinely great to talk to. Very easy. Just need to get past that uh, phase of, you know, I don't want to just harass you about questions about the game. I actually want to get to know you because, yeah. you know, it, it gets a little. I'm pretty sure they get a little tired of the questions. Yep. So absolutely. I, but however, they ended up answering them and then some. So I got some. I got a handful of juicy details. Very Are you allowed good. to share? I uh, don't know. <laughs> oh, so I might have to keep my mouth shut. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, th- th- there were a few things. Um, I believe the uh, food stuff that was being discussed. Um, uh, we talked about... God, uh, what is his name? Uh, Audion, um College of Arms Tesser- guy. Tesseron. Yeah. Yes. Tesseron, sorry. Yes. Yeah, he uh, he brought up the topic of potions being, you know, with alcohol. I remember we were waiting in line. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to go into the uh, soda panel. And, yeah. uh, no, no, it wasn't the soda panel. It was for the, um, I think, wait, actually, it was a soda panel. Yeah, we were talking about uh, how food's going to affect you, and he brought up alcohol. And I think it, um, there's a video I showed Richard as an example because uh, we were talking about healing regeneration. Yes, and uh, how I think Star and Richard took the idea of uh, when you're getting hit, you don't completely regenerate your health. A certain percentage is actually locked out until you can actually fully functionally heal yourself. Right. So, like, say if I do 100 damage, 20, 25 
to probably 10% of the damage you can't recover. Okay. And, oh. Until you go somewhere. So yeah, we were talking about stuff like that, and then uh, uh, Tassaran brought in, uh, because we said, like, you know, we don't want to be, like, chugging down potions like crazy. And uh, Audien uh, brought up, you know, why don't we just make potions have alcohol? Sense of food yeah. will actually have uh, uh, an issue. And we were all looked at it and we were like, that's freaking brilliant. That's so, nice. Yeah. It, yeah. So that was just, that was pretty fun. Um, a heads up uh, a good source of material to why chugging potions is foolish. Uh, for those listening, look up Corridor Digital Potion and, or Wizard Wars and you'll see what's going on. Right. Yeah. And that's a really good idea because uh, if you're in battle, and you're chugging down potions like crazy, well, you might be pretty healthy, but you can't walk. Exactly, right. or you can't walk straight. Yeah, that's right. If you find that balance, that's excellent. Yeah, yep. no, that's good. Okay. Anyway, um, in the news it says that during the release they had the um, PvP matches and they renamed Chaos and Order to Pax vs. Dragon Con. <laughs> in honour of the conventions. And the winner was... Dragon Con. Yay! Yay! Yay. Yes. Dragon uh, Con equaled some serious hurt on PAX. It was the undisputed winner with 34 wins to PAX's 14. So there geez. you go. I'm going to assume, yep, Dragon Con was chaos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> looking at the <laughs> screenshot. Well, no, I mean, uh, there's actually... It's it. Here's another little funny side story in case anybody didn't notice. Uh, when Richard was actually playing in there, uh, you know how the did you play the PvP at all or test it out the arena? Uh, who me? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Look, I tried PvP, and I suck officially. Oh, well, well, no, it, it'll it'll get better. But um, remember how at each point there's like a little Tesla coil kind of thing that like shoots down people. Yeah. Uh, if you're from the opposing side, uh, Richard oh, right. trying to balance out the whole battle would actually mm. run towards the enemy side, be immortal, and try to <laughs> have everybody hit him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So that's another little side story. I don't know if I'm supposed to tell that, but apparently he'd run in there, have everybody focus on him to give yeah. uh, everybody who's out there fighting a chance to take down any of the Reds. Oh. Love it. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> However, he said he still couldn't kill anybody, so... Oh, that's amazing. So he's cheating in his own game? I love it. He's he's cheating and he still couldn't win. <laughs> What's the issue? That, that That's just, that's the thing you need to take away from this. Sad star is more devious than he is. Oh, that's lovely. Okay. Yeah? All right. And I mean, I've tried PvP. I didn't try these matches. I, I tried PvP a little bit. And oh, I'm a sad puppy because I haven't done it before. And it takes a whole different skill set. And not only that is building these decks. I've only just managed to build a deck that works any good at PvE. And, uh, and then I thought, oh yeah, this is good, I can do this. So I go over to Brave Coast and stuff and die in about 15 seconds flat. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's going to take time. I'm not yeah, very it's... experienced PvPer. Yeah, there was uh, conversations uh, as well in terms of people fighting for and against the uh, combat system in uh, oh, yeah. in in the panels. And I remember the last time I said I was kind of wary about it. I'm actually all for it now. Oh, good, great. Yeah, with the way that they were talking about it, it um, just the way it's set up. I, mean, I think uh, the one, I think I, I made a, a slight jab at the combat last time, saying it was like River Dancing Whack a Mole. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and then and then yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then. Uh, uh, Duke Violin's violation, like he looked at me and he's just like, but whack a mole requires skill. And then, like, all of a sudden, just like clicked in my head, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh-uh. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, because, like, the way the way the, the deck system works, and uh, I had to actually have him explain to me how yes. it all fully functions since he was apparently, um, who was the main PvP -er, uh last time? The one who was uh, destroying everybody? Esparta. Esparta, yeah. Apparently, yes. he went toe to toe against him just fine. Wow. That's yeah, cool. that's true. yeah. So apparently, he says it's it's it, the learning curve is so steep right now. You don't yeah. know what combination does what, and the whole combination thing makes the biggest deal in the world. Sure. Yeah, so so are again, they going to, 
are they going to start flipping the decks? Meaning once everybody comes up with their master deck, they're going to throw a curveball in there to get everybody to start updating decks? The curveball would probably just be like the slugs that would appear. Uh, but, I mean, the, the good thing about the decks is is that, you know, if a skill is broken, you just need, you just need to replace it. So uh, they they might they might lock it down. I mean they're still testing. They're trying to even out the battlefield and just make it so it's purely skill based, so that they can see what the end outcome is in terms of you know who can do the cards better and st- and stuff like that. But I mean they might. I mean I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it yeah. sounds really exciting. Uh, one of the quotes I loved was from Chris himself. He was talking about this whole combat system and how you work it out. And if you try and do it by spreadsheets and numbers and, you know, DPS and da 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 all that sort of stuff, after a little while your brain just explodes. Because there's so many variables and you've got cooldowns and you've got spells but being I able to be a... interrupted and stuff. It, but you, you, I do worry that it's going to be... Because there are certain people who have that skill set. Yeah. I mean, here in America, there are baseball statisticians that live for oh, that. Really? Well... Well, yeah. not not just that, but you also get the South Koreans. Oh, right. Yeah. They, yes. they live for that mathematical and analytical properties. There will be masters. Yes. I um, can tell. There was one quote, I believe, I, I remember Chris saying, is like he wants the combat to be reminiscent to how the new MOBA games are like, the uh, multiplayer online battle arenas, games such as uh, Heroes of New Worth, uh, League of Legends, and Defense of the Ancients. Mainly not not their exact play style, but how the uh, um, it, it's skill-based, but it's slow enough that you can figure out what's going on. Okay. And it's and each, each skill is like it's... Uh, it, it, it's yeah as you said you can't run dps numbers the entire time because you don't have a constant flow of damage you have stuns you have breaks you have uh, the fact that the cards are random yeah as well that's right. it's yeah you it's just you're not a whole new able, dimension to it yeah you're not going to be able to instantly make a perfect deck but i believe over time as joe said there will be masters who will instantly like get it yes yeah so. well it took me three releases but towards the third release, that's the this last weekend of release nine, I managed to find a deck that was working really well for PvE. I was walking around slaying satyrs with one hand tied behind my back almost. It was, it was actually easy. I, I, um, I had plate armor. I had all of the earth-related buffs. So my damage protection was way up the wazoo. I was wandering around with a lich axe, doing enormous amounts of damage, and it was actually fun. One, That's... one other. Th- oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, one other thing I'll I'll put in here. I don't know if a lot of people know it. Um, you yeah. are aware that you can actually lock your uh, your deck bar, right? Yes. Yeah, so you can lock it so it's, it plays like a standard MMO. Kind of oh, thing. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, you can you can lock it. However, you do not have the ability to actually combine cards, which is where the big seller is. Uh, but you do have the ability to actually set it so, like, I just want, you know, this ability here, this ability here, this ability here. But you're not going to be good during competitive play with that setup. But if you just want to go ahead and play, you know, player versus environment kind of scenario, you should be able to do it just fine with that setup. If it's too too weird you can actually uh, i believe you said you can combine the two sort of where i think you only have what six cards during uh with the uh the standard setup the uh the the combining setup six cards right yeah yeah oh yeah. you can yeah 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 you, you mean can lock mix? you can lock one of those slots into a permanent skill yes yeah i was walking around with seven cards in my hand two of them were locked so I, I knew I had those two available all the time, and the other five were popping up randomly. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of things. A lot of people didn't know that when they were explaining it the first time uh, during the uh, soda conversation. Yeah, yeah. see, yeah. Joe Joe's mind just exploded. I know. <laughs> oh, hastily scribbling notes hastily. Oh yes, yeah. So I knew that. So okay, I'm looking at seven little slots on the bottom of the screen, and little glyphs are drifting out of them in and out of them all the time 
and whatever glyph is in there at the time, that's what you can do. That's that's the skill that you can use, that's the attack you've got, or whatever. But numbers six and seven were there all the time. And I knew that one of them was a healing spell. Okay, I, I can heal myself any time I like. And number seven was a knight's grace. That's a... It's a benefit of the heavy armour division. So if somebody hurls a stun spell at you, if you've got that active, you're not affected by it. So I can activate that any time I want to, because that's there all the time. Nice, and nice. Yeah, that, that sort of seemed to be working. <sighs> I can't yep, wait. One other th- oh, for yeah. since... Uh, one other thing, Joe. You, since you are the collector, I forget. Do you have the shirts of the current sigils? No, sir, I do not. You need to quickly do it because they did replace uh, one of the uh, schools. If anybody noticed that. Okay. Which yes. school? They replaced medium armor. So I have to go get the medium armor shirt ASAP. No. No, you need to get the shirt that has all the sigils of light armor, heavy armor, medium armor, oh, okay. sword. Yeah, you need to get that one because it's going to be a collector's item because they replaced uh, medium armor with tactician. Oh, okay. Yes. Right, that's good to know. Yep, just letting oh. you know right now. So quickly run somebody down and grab that shirt. I find it hysterical that there are people, not only you, but other people who send me emails and basically go, you have to get this now because, you know, it's just, it's incredibly cool that people yeah. appreciate that that I'm, I, that's my passion. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. Well, you, you've done a great job, Joe, and you must have an enormous collection there. It's unbelievable. Thank God I have a wife who understands me. It's starting to spill out into a second room. <laughs> it's, it's so, again, she's, oh gosh, she's so patient with me. That's awesome. You find somebody like that, you never let them go. Abso- oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, look, back to the news just briefly. Um, yes, sir. Chris put out a perspective on R9, and you're talking about spell reagents. That was a hot topic. Uh, for this release, as people are probably aware, they, okay, they just messed with it. It's not the final iteration. They just said, okay, look, for this release, tier one and two spells, you don't need reagents, tier three and up. Well, if you've got reagents, they'll work better. They're less likely to fizzle. But um, all that's going to change. And uh, Why? Uh, why? It still needs it still needs tweaking. It's oh, the, it does. like the it does. like like the um, you know uh, the way it fizzles. What's the percentage chance of it fizzling? Because some people may have been said like, "Oh my god, I can't cast a spell at all without the reagents." Which <laughs> Joe, which, which Joe, I agree. I, I, I'm seeing where you're coming from. If you don't have the reagents, you shouldn't be able to cast a spell in the first place. Right. Yeah, I knew you were heading down that path. But okay, yeah, they also sorry. need. They, yeah, it's cool. They also need to cater towards the. Uh, the hardcore PvPers, I guess, who just want to go and competitively fight. Um, I, I don't know how they're going to balance it. Uh, I know Chris's whole spiel with reagents is casters will be spending money on reagents, whereas warriors will be spending their money on repairing their gear. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah. That's how that's how they're going to work. And there's your financial sink too. Yep. Yeah. Good. Now I think from memory, I'm, I I don't know if I'm correct, but. Uh, an impression I got was that some of the lower tier spells, like a simple heal spell that any warrior could cast, level one spell, that might not require a reagent or put it this way, it'll always work. But if you're a mage and if you're casting high level spells, level three and up, you probably should be using reagents and if if you don't have any reagents on you, then there's at least a 50% chance that the spell will fizzle. That or backfire. Yeah, well, f- yeah, fair enough. And that's... that's. I think that might be the current thinking. Uh, that's a way that they're looking to go to strongly encourage people to invest in reagents. 
And that also hits the logical point of it, as well as the gameplay balance portion of it. Sure. You, you don't bring an empty gun to a knife fight. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's Can't right. throw a fireball without a black pearl. That's there right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, how often have we played all the single player Ultimas and you have to go out and find your reagents? Exactly. And often mix them up. And then then you can cast some spells. Yeah. Okay. But how do you find Nightshade during the day? That was the one that always used to frustrate me. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, this could be a part of the interdependent economy. You go to the stall or the vendor of the person who's prepared to go out at night and harvest the nightshade. Which would be me. That's what. That's where I see myself. There you go. So you are the crafter, the farmer, the gatherer. And... I'm the lover, not the fighter. <laughs> Terrific. And you know what? There's a lot of you in the game, and I think that's wonderful. Oh yeah, it's it's great. The whole the whole crafting ecosystem that Richard was talking about. The whole yeah. you sell twenty swords to a vendor, ten of those swords will be in the shop, and ten yeah. others will be spread them out spread out amongst uh you know the npcs and the monsters in the world is great yeah that's so, good. yeah, yeah. I, however um i think i busted uh frank uh sir frank's bubble uh yeah. this is something that i think is okay to tell yes um potentially uh frank wanted to pvp via subterfuge he was tempting to actually go into dungeons equipped with the best gear that he could make and die intentionally and feed all those monsters the gear uh, so that yeah. so that so that anybody who goes in there would actually suffer. However, <laughs> Star actually went up and said like that's not going to be possible. They'll they'll be like um, certain uh, and certain mobs will have a threshold of you know the the of whatever weapon they have. Yeah. yeah. So you know they they won't have like the best armor in the whole game is given to a lowly skeleton monster. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, it would have been a great way. I thought. I honestly wish that that they did that. That would have been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, but you're but but you're 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 you get the opportunity of tweaking the mechanics, which is kind of unfair. I get. Yeah, it is. <laughs> no, you can't do that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but it would be a pleasant way. It's like, what if you do join the chaos side? <laughs> what if you like feed this dungeon? Gear, <laughs> but if he had kept his mouth oh, shut, that's just wrong. It, could, it might have been overlooked. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. maybe. All, I mean, he, we're all we all benefit from the fact that he couldn't keep quiet, and now they have, now they'll fix that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, it's actually my fault for not keeping quiet. I actually brought that up with Star, <laughs> so I kind of messed him up. That was my fault. Excellent. No, oh, that's good. Okay. All right. More news. There's a new developer plus asset pack if people are wanting to get involved. Um, and it's all about leather and cloth armor sets. And so, for all the people out there who understand Unity and want to mess around with making armor and designing armor, that's it. Beautiful. Two things. Yeah, yes. two things popped in here for me though. Yes, yes. Uh, one, I actually do love their cloth and leather armor. Secondly, yep. I I think I was pretty pretty loud in the developers plus forums and how I actually disliked the plate armor. Right. So I'm sitting here hoping uh, because they only developed a kit specifically for these two classes that they are retweaking uh-huh. the uh, plate armor. So okay. retweaking my the, spots, the plate armor. Retweaking the look, the artwork. I would uh, hope um, we did run a test uh, with I think Sir Style uh, Style Tekel's mom and showed her the game with the plate armor with the leather and cloth armor and she said yeah it's a pretty good game showed it with the uh, plate armor and they're like is this World of Warcraft oh interesting okay. yeah so I lean towards more realistic uh, sets of armor like the leather and the cloth over here it looks pretty decent it looks yes. like it'd be workable but the uh, plate seems a little funky to me Okay. I know I'm probably pissing off their art director, but... <laughs> <laughs> With the amount of uh, backwash they get from the forums, I'm sure they're pretty thick-skinned by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. They are, they are. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Now we have the Hangout of the Avatar, which I just finished watching last night. Nature to Nutrition. Uh, that was amazing. Um, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. That's what we were discussing just before we went to air, Joe. He right. Was, he was talking all about that in great detail. It was nearly yep. a two-hour session. Yeah, um, he... Absolutely yeah, sorry. fascinating. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, sorry. Like, uh, the, the two other meetings specifically for Shadow of the Avatar that I went to in DragonCon, this was brought up twice, and he went in even more detail every time. Yeah. It was... Yeah, again, uh, uh, God, I forgot his name. Tazaran, uh, uh, Audio, uh, Audion. Uh, Audion, Audion. And I'm horrible. Uh, again, he brought up the whole alcohol thing, which was amazing. And we were talking about the health regeneration. And uh, we were talking about, uh, I don't know if he mentioned it, but yeah, you can puke all your stuff out. Yep, yes. <laughs> yep. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, they, I didn't, yeah, yeah, he already had that pre planned. Um, God, what else did wait, he talk wait, about? Wait, wait, wait. What you're saying is, is that you can you can quaff all the potions if you want, but then when you vomit, you lose the benefits. You lose Absolutely. the benefits. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh that's yes. good. Yeah. Yes. So I'm 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 hoping for a if I'm fighting somebody with the cloth armor, a gut punch, and uh, <laughs> that'll that'll take out all their buffs. So that's what I'm hoping for. So minus one for armor cleaning. Yes. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Upon the action, the person uh, gets like uh, snared and uh, confused. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun to see. Yep. Excellent. And we have Clockwork Pets, would you believe? If you're a royal artisan, an explorer, or a patron, you get a Clockwork Pet as part of your pledge. And yes. Um, a clockwork cat and a clockwork dog. Don't know if you have to wind them up every day. <laughs> sounds interesting, though. It does. Not just. It sounds interesting. The models on them look insanely beautiful. Oh yeah, I just saw the dog. It looks amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's great. It's well done, isn't it? Incredibly well done, Jesus. Yeah. Yes, and we've got character armor va- variations. On Pen of the Avatar, I haven't had a chance to catch up with it yet, but that looks as if it's going to be really interesting. At the very end, Stephen gets a uh, splash with a bucket of water. Oh. Cool. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Did you see in the forum? That's the one that's going around by Dame Laurie. She's got. No, the... I'm afraid. <laughs> She's got the I... picture of him, just after having been doused by the bucket of water. Uh, her, her latest competition is to put a caption to it. Oh, horrible oh, things about that. that. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, put a caption to this photo and enter Dame Laurie's competition. That's wonderful. Okay, a little story about Through the Lunar Rift, and then we've got the Alienware promo, and that's the news for the week, folks. Excellent. So, now, Lord Jouton... You were at Dragon Con. I saw a photo of you there at breakfast. So that must have been an awesome experience. Yep. So, yep. <laughs> I can go on forever, and, uh, but I kind of want to hold back. <laughs> no, I want to hear it. I definitely want to hear it. Oh, I was yes. truce with envy when I saw that picture. Oh, look, I mean, you know, mixing with all those people, that, that must have just been awesome. Yes, it was. It was... Uh, I can't really... Like... I was afraid I was going to be stepping on somebody's toes because I didn't want to talk about game development the whole time. But again, they were great sports about it and they were bringing it up and talking about it themselves. Yeah. Um, again, uh, Richard, amazing guy, caught me off guard that, you know, yeah, I'm sitting right beside him. Uh, in the picture, he's actually uh, where he actually s- sat where the camera was being oh, taken. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Shot he, was, so, he moved yeah, down so to the end of the table for the shot. Yes. Mm. Yep. So I was like sitting towards his left the whole time, you know, just oh. gawking at him the whole time. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, oh, he had a panel uh, about about space. I think that was the first time I talked to him that uh, during that whole Dragon Con, he had the panel of commercializing space. Yes. And uh, the great thing about it was that they actually had people there from uh, uh, SpaceX 
and other people with the Elon Musk and stuff like that and actual scientists talking. And the whole time uh, when the topic of like actually feeling space out, they all kind of just like circled on uh, on Richard to say like, hey, how was uh, how was space like oh, the whole time? Because yeah. uh, they wanted to get his idea on it. And uh, yes. he, he gave out a lot of stories that were pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Like the whole, you know, apparently going out in space, you, you come back somehow enlightened really? about like how the world works. Yeah, like you look at it and you're like, why do we have borders? Why, oh, you know, yes, yes. yeah, yeah, that kind of deal. And he's like, you like get a whole new perspective on the world. Yeah, because he he's going around the world in 45 minutes, but it, the world is yeah. detailed enough that he can still see, you know, the the, the his path to work. Right. But he's seeing all of it around the world. So Amazing. it's it's yeah it's like it was like that's that uh, that's probably would have been an overload for me, but yeah. yeah he he was talking about that and it was it was an amazing type of conversation to hear him you know discuss about the potential. Are they online anywhere? Online. The, yeah the the did anybody video it so we could see? Oh them? no 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 none of these none of these had a uh, video at least not that I know of. Uh yeah, I wish I could find it. There he did have a uh, interview though with um that was posted uh, at DragonCon later that uh, day. I forgot what it was called. Um, let me see. Richard Gere had an interview with somebody, but uh, they they discussed space, and I think one of the biggest topics that they talked about was how it's hard to separate yourself from your own crap. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, good, Im- good, good topics on that. Important subject. Yep. So, oh, very. It's like toothpaste in space. You just can't. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. And you, you've been to a lot of the um, Dragon Meets haven't you? Oh yeah. I haven't. Yeah. I haven't been to the previous most important ones like when. Joseph uh, revealed that you know he got um, he's stepping down and all oh, right yeah all that stuff so I felt horrible um, yeah. but yeah I've always been to the Dragon's meets uh, I've always been to all the events that he's hosted yeah. uh, even drove up from Georgia going all the way up to uh, 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 where the heck did he live way up north Indiana yeah, yeah, yeah. Indiana yeah yeah going up there twice random guy met on the internet yeah uh, no, I've, I've heard that I've heard there's a story about you. You be always being asked to strip at Dragon Mates. That's um. <laughs> what's what's this story behind that? Uh, the the story goes uh, was when we did the kick. We had our own little telethon or hangoutathon or whatever. Yes. Uh, we were trying to fund money for uh, you know trying to incentivize, and apparently uh, Joseph had this bright idea. It's like, oh, let's just go ahead and make David strip. That'll, that'll definitely rake in the cash. I'm like, how about and we just make it to the people? It was just an offhand comment, too. It, it was an offhanded comment. And then, yeah. uh, hold on. There's actually somebody. I forgot his name. He was actually a really cool guy in the forums. Created this little picture. It's like this uh, meme of sorts where I'm just face palming. It says, like, you know, drove eight hours, asked to strip. Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> kind of a dealio. And it was, it was unexpected. Actually, here it is. Come the image URL from uh, Sy W S Y E. He was the one who created it, and yeah, it was not intended. However, the so horrible things came out of it because of the stripping thing. I think every hour, a developer <laughs> would come in and try to uh, a developer would come in and try to give me a stripper name, yeah. and I believe the <laughs> one that won was Lums. Was Lums? It was a simple name. It was Chloe. Yeah. So apparently, my stage name is Chloe. Yes. Oh. And uh, thanks to love. I love how this little private in joke has already made its way to Australia. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. <laughs> That's yeah. Uh, uh... Well, you have style to blame for that. He sort of fills us in on the guests before they come. Love it. It's uh, great. Uh, oh, gorgeous. So you are wearing clothes now. Yes, always <laughs> and forever. Good to hear. <laughs> yes, I go take a shower in swimming trunks. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Now, Joe, tell me, you have a huge... No, I'm scared because you're going to start dealing the dirt on me too. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Nobody gets out of here alive, I tell you. 
<laughs> You've got a huge collection of or Origin and Ultimate stuff. When did this start? This all started, gosh, in the late nineties, maybe yeah. mid nineties. Yeah. And it was one of those it was one of those things that, you know, we all have our little you know, our little pile or our little bookshelf of the games that we love and blah blah blah. And yeah. I suddenly turned around and went, Wow, all these games are from the same company. How yeah. weird is that? And yeah. and it and it got out of control from that. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I can remember, and you probably can too, Lord Jerton. You buy these Ultima games. They come in this cool little box. They've got a cloth map there. They've got a little trinket in there. And I guess most people, probably like myself, you play the game, you enjoy it. Time goes by. Oh, where's the box? I don't know. Where's the cloth map? Oh, it's gone. The trinket got lost years ago. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's what happens, unfortunately. But they were such cool things. Absolutely. And I think they were originally designed because the graphics and sound of the OSs back then, of the computers back then, weren't, uh, weren't fully fleshed out, obviously. It was the early sure. days. It was the, it was the non-talkies, black and white movie era of video gaming. And those yes. were extra pieces to help draw you into the storyline. Yeah. Although well, we don't believe- need them now they're still incredibly important. Yeah. yeah. Especially the fourth one, since it actually tells you to read the manual. <laughs> read the, yeah. yeah, you read the book of history, and then in parentheses it says, no, really, read the book of history. Read the book of history, exactly. And yes. You're, and you're looking, yeah, they broke that third wall, and you're looking at it going, oh, this 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 manual's right here in front of me. This is wild. And and I it always gives me this weird uh, bout of pleasure that, Everybody who was into Ultima when they were new has understands that experience where the cloth map is actually like laid splayed across your knee. You're reading this book and the Ankh from four is sitting on your Apple II, you know, yep. above the keyboard. And it's funny that I've talked to many people who have shared that thing and they're like, I did that exact same thing. And we never really talked about it, but it's so neat to meet these other people that go, I know exactly what you're referring to, you know? I know. I had the cloth map on my desktop for years. Yeah, and it's funny because now, even now, I, I if, if I get a, a donation or I buy something off of eBay and you open up these boxes, a lot of times, not only will you find the original pieces that are in it, and some of them are dog-eared and some of them are brand new, but yep. what I think is most amazing is that I find other people's notes from 20 years ago still in the box you know it's like graph paper and things like that and you go they loved this game this was you know what i mean yeah they they sent their heart along with the game when you buy it on ebay and you end up opening these things i have found fan fiction from people really that they tuck away in the bottom of the box and they probably don't even know that it's still in there when they when they send it you know after you buy it on auction and you go this is a moment in someone's life. I mean, those yeah. things that would, I still think that would make a great article. If I went through all the old boxes and looked at other people's work and the amount of energy that they put in the game, I, uh, there's a, a it just sprung to mind. There is, I found one for wing commander one that I'm still convinced. I have to go find some of the wing commander, true subject matter experts. But I think that I can confirm that, I have probably the earliest Wing Commander fan fiction that's ever been written because it happens to be dated and it's wow. on a dot matrix printout and like that. So it's wonderful to see these people's memories just put into this box and they, they saved them as much as, as much as anyone else would. It was their passion. It was part of their lives. Yep. And to be able to preserve this and share it with the world eventually, I think is really important. It is. That brings back memories. I thought a dot matrix printer was so cool. Right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, brilliant. So how many items do you reckon you have, Joe? I would say in the thousands. I've never counted, but it is definitely in the thousands. And we're talking about not only the games themselves. Yeah. Which covers a broad spectrum because you're talking rare games uh, imports on you know different country variations and all that stuff. Uh, then there's sealed versus unsealed. I've, I've yeah. done my best to try to create an entire 
origin collection of sealed games. So I got every single one pristine the way it would have looked like in the store. But then on top of that, it's original artwork and uh, digital music files and props from some of the video portions of it, some developers tools, unreleased games, you know, wow. it, it just posters, uh, uh, tchotchkes, you know, every type of those little things that they sell. I mean, an Ultima Online mug, which to 99.99% of the world means nothing. But I know that there is some person in Germany who this will make a connection to that they'll say I had that mug or yes. I always wanted to get that beer stein or that you know I've had long conversations with people where they all have their own individual stories about the Ankh in Ultima 4 and you know I had that on a chain and wore it for nine years until the metal finally broke through and I lost it oh, these are incredible yeah. stories you know they are Yep. Wow, that's really cool. And then you find somebody else who goes, I did that same thing, except I used string when I was nine. And I kept it. I wore it for a whole summer. You know, and you go, yep. wow, you find these connections that I don't even think that the developers themselves realize the impact that they made on so many lives. I I will comment one thing real quick on the whole collection and making sure that they're sealed in pristine con uh, condition. Uh, there was one individual at Dragon's Con who actually had the Ultima Five Warriors of Destiny, um, a game, still yeah. sealed, but presented uh, it towards Richard Garriott, and he ripped the seal. Garriott broke the shrink wrap. No, 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 not Garriott. The other guy did. The, the owner guy who of presented the... it. The owner of the item broke the shrink wrap. However, what however, was the so that he could get it autographed. So he can get it autographed. However, here, 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 here. Uh, everybody who was standing there, I believe uh, Violation was there to witness it as well. We're all freaking out, going like, "What the hell's wrong with you? What the hell's wrong with you?" <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, I'm serious. And then Richard Garrett like looks at us. He's like, "Don't worry, you know, if he wants it resealed, I have the original, you know, machine we used to seal the games back at my house." <laughs> the, he has the original shrink wrap machine. Yes, from yes. <laughs> yes, at least one of them. One one of the ones that were officially used. So we're all like, wait, so he can get it signed and then like send it to Richard and then get it sealed and then signed again. And that is what makes that man such a great guy because he it is into his head and he went and he's the kind of guy that goes, I'll go into my garage or my storage unit or wherever it happens to be and I'll break it out and I will reshrink this. For this one fan in Peoria, yeah, you know, yeah. I love it. I, I mean, he gets it, and that's the biggest part of it. Not only because I, I, I've had the honor of meeting many, many developers, and like I say, some of them get it, and some of them, I mean, let's be honest, it's just a job for some folks, and that's cool, but there are others that go, I so get you, and I get it, and Richard's one of those cats. It's terrific. He's like one of the first which is what makes him so important. But even as high as he is, I'm sorry, he looms large in the legends of many, many oh, of yes. the same. But he still remembers the passion that he had when he was young and can appreciate it enough that I can see him on a Saturday morning digging through, you know, like his storage unit to go find this because... Some forty-year-old man, you know, in in Germany, is saying, "Can you res could you reseal this for me?" Yeah. And he says, "Sure, no problem. I love it." Yeah, that's awesome, isn't it? Absolutely. But I also amazing. think it's funny that I'm not a hundred percent sure if his wife gets it or not. So she must be looking at him like he's insane while he's digging through to try to find his old shrink wrap machine. Huh? Uh, I'm pretty sure she she gets the scope of how important he is. I keep on telling this to everybody I meet. Who again? I was born in 1990, so uh, my generation of people don't really get the history or the lore. It's just I was fortunate enough to see my dad play Ultima and him using the uh, you know the graph paper and all that stuff. So I kind of grabbed the passion, I guess, like yep. from him. Uh, but. Uh, Wait, you're trying to tell me that I have floppy disks older than you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I had to. I'm no, perfectly fine. Now I completely forgot my train of thought. 
shit, where was I going with this? <clears throat> Damn, I lost it. You, you, got, you got the passion from your father, you said. Yeah, it was yeah. something prime. Oh, yeah, and how important he is. Just A lot of people just don't get it. Again, one, one of the people who were there that I was with, uh, my friend Jackson, um, he didn't know who Lord British... Uh, he, well, he didn't know who Richard Garriott was until a name dropped Lord British. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't get, you know, the, the importance of how... You know, Avatar is used so much these days. You know, you got a cartoon, you know, Avatar, yeah. The Last Airbender. And then you got, like, you know, the Avatar, the movie. And then nobody gets, like, you know, it's for, it was originally a Hindu word, but, you know, Richard Gary coined a term. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole moral system, you know, being developed back in 1985. You know, not Fable, not, you know, not Dragon Age, way back. Uh, the fact that, you know, he was the first person to put a game in a box, he got rid of the Ziploc bag, the... You know, just just so many things he's done. Just not too many people actually get it. So, and I love the fact that he gets it too. And, and yes. it's that he he has pointed out to people that the word shards was invented by him and his team. Yep, and Star Long brings it up all the time. Now, wow. uh, they, the word gumps is just bandied about among all MMO players and how that goes. But but. He realizes that oh my gosh we we made that up. Yep. Fantastic. I mean, they were the first person to actually say to play our game. You need to make an account. Yeah. For Ultima Online. Mm-hmm. I didn't even so, realize that. Interesting. Yeah, they were the first. They were the first for a lot of things. They were the first for shards. First for instances. First for just just a ridiculous amount of stuff, which is why I have such. Uh, which is why when Shadow of the Avatar came out and it says like, oh, Richard Garrett's in it, I just like threw money as fast as I could. Yes. As soon as I saw that, it's like my first instant reaction was I need to get my card out. Yep, yep. Well, similarly with me. I mean, <clears throat> as Joe and I were talking before we went on air here, when Ultima 7 came out, we had to become geeks. We had to learn how to mess with our computers and work out the config sys and auto exec bat files because Richard was always pushing the envelope and doing things that nobody else did with computers to get a better game and a more complex game and when Ultima 9 came out it was in 3D which is fantastic and in those days it was written in voodoo <laughs> yeah and have you heard so... that phrase Joe? voodoo I've heard Voodoo before, yes. So I don't yes. know if he made that, but have you heard of the Voodoo Memory Manager? Yeah, no. Long cool? story short, basically, IBM PCs only had 640k available RAM. You could only use Ugh. that much if you had, even if you had like four meg in your machine, which was back then. Oh, that was a lot. Yeah, yeah, you had yeah. to be a millionaire to have four meg in your machine. <laughs> You could still only use 640K of it at any given time. So what they would do is they would write these programs, other companies, to enable you to take advantage of that extended or expanded memory. Well, Origin didn't like the way they did that. So Origin, basically, for Ultima 7, they wrote their own memory manager that would basically alter the way hardware worked in a PC in order to give you a better gaming experience. It was an Christ. incredible amount of work to do just to do it, just to make sure that they stayed on top of that mountain for, isn't this really cool? You know? All it's I remember, a testament I mean, to that. Yeah. I mean, all, all I remember in terms of like Ultima, you know, pushing horsepower was, I think I was eight Eight, eight years old and I'm like trying to sneak into my dad's computer when he's off to work trying to play Ultima 9 and I'm freaking out every single time I get to BSOD right yeah I right. had to save every minute because it was like pushing the computer so much yeah, yeah. and yeah. what I think is funny is that uh, uh, the, the whole idea of exactly what Asclepius was trying to point out was that le- you had to learn config sys and auto exec bat which was basically how to manage memory on the computer and how to get different programs to run and getting getting the different features of the games to work and your reward was you got to play the game but inadvertently origin ended up starting the it careers of people around the world because we i was ended going 
I did. They did. Yeah, that's right. Becoming experts at getting memory management working. And you go, yeah. well, I've been in this all the time. I mean, Richard Garriott gave me my career in a manner of speaking. Yep. And I'm sure thousands of people across the globe. He's bred I, I, a race of nerds and geeks. Uh-huh. <laughs> we were weaned. We or were. Richard- <laughs> That's right. And as I was saying, when, Ultim- when, when Ultima 9 came out, I willingly went and dropped 500 bucks on a 3D video card. Oh, absolutely. You so have to do it to time. play the game. That's I always what joke you want to do. Origin sent me scampering down the upgrade path more times than I can count. I oh, spent yes. thousands of dollars in their name. Yes. I have to have a CD-ROM drive. Yep. Now yep. I have to have 2X CD-ROM drive. Now yep. I need now. a sound tester card. Oh, it was ridiculous. Okay. Now now with with all this in mind, do you believe they're going to be pushing the envelope with uh, Shadow of the Avatar? I don't believe so. No. Yeah. They're not. And I no. don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Because yeah. the, the whole concept is to harken back to that classic gaming idea, which back then was cutting edge, but now it's really not. The cutting edge for Shroud, I believe, is in the storytelling, is in the ethical dilemmas, is in all of the things that really made the Ultima series so great. One of those things, I believe, is the fact that unlike most MMOs or RPGs or anything like that right now, is the fact that when you play Shroud of the Avatar, even though it's not fully fleshed out, you're interacting with everything. Yeah, That's that's the biggest selling point to me. It's the fact that, oh, I gotta actually flip this switch. Oh, I gotta... Oh, there's torches in this bin I need to take out. Mm. You know, stuff like that. And that you don't see that anymore. You no, don't. The, it, the interaction with the environment and everything works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. 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 One thing that I remember Chris saying, I think it's really brilliant of them. Whenever we log on to play in these releases, somehow or other, very sneakily, they know what kind of computer we're running. And they know our specs, uh, you know, processor, graphic ability, whatever, da, da 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 And they are going to try to pitch it so that the game is playable on at least 90% of computers that are connected. Yep. Love it. So that's great. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, the fact that you, I mean, you have settings you can adjust for people who yep. have higher-end specs. That's not right. only that, but yep. they're, uh, they're still waiting on uh, Unity 5, I believe. I, I think when I went down there, uh, with uh, Dame Lori and Sir Frank to meet with uh, Joseph. Uh, they were talking about Unity, and they said that they're just as much in the dark as everybody else. Oh, right. So yeah. so with the new stuff coming up, I believe they'll be able to push it optionally yeah. for other yes. people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Speaking and- of which, they made a big, uh, a big to-do when Shroud was brand new on the block. That they were talking about the 3D environments and the, you know, the headsets and all that. Yeah. Um, has that developed at all? Are they still backing? You know. Oh, we talking about the the Oculus Rift stuff. They actually they did make a comment on that a long time ago, saying that they that it's not something that they're really going to pursue, seeing how they need to focus all their resources on actually making a good game first. I think that's a smart and clever move. Yeah, I yeah. agree. How, however, there are obviously a lot of Kickstarter people who are probably upset about that, but at the same time, it's like, you know, what other games out there do you see doing VR right now and doing VR successfully? You expect uh, these guys... Who, one. Huh? And that's all. I know of Wait, one. Uh, Star Citizen. Chris I was Roberts. about to say, it's like, is, is this Star Citizen not even out yet? But no, I agree with you. But no, like, that's the only one... There are a couple. There are a couple that are actually working on it. But the fact that you know you got Richard Garriott making this game on top of trying to make it VR, the amount of crap that they're doing already without making it VR is insane in terms of interaction, your character yeah. moving, and all that stuff. Then right. trying to make it VR as well—that's just that's too much for five million and only thirty-two people. And it uh, depends, it's, right? And and it depends on your environment. I mean, Star Citizen, a space opera game lends itself to that 3D VR. If somebody's yep. on your six, it's really great to be able to spin around and look behind you and see that person. It doesn't lend itself to an RPG as much. It's a fun little novelty, 
but why put all that much work into it if it's only going to be a fun little novelty? I mean, but that's what I meant. In the in the forums, I was actually trying to type out like, what is your end goal in terms of character, animation, and in terms of camera movement because and UI. Because if you're going to be doing VR, I think I, I did this a long time ago. If you're doing VR, you can't have your user interface locked to the very bottom and to the right of your screen because you're never going to be able to see it. You need to go ahead and make sure that you know when you're getting hit, the whole screen needs to adjust to you getting hit. But Good since point. they're throwing that, so yeah, so since they're throwing all that away, you know, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about that, which is good because it's less stress that they have to handle. However, thing is, though, we get that, but a lot of people in the forums don't, mm. and they <sighs> always. It all comes down re- to so what? It all comes down to experience. I mean, you're a very knowledgeable and experienced gamer. And you get that. A lot of other people, they're only in it so they can walk around and, you know, look at the sky and, you know, and look at other people. They don't understand the bigger picture concepts of gameplay and things like that. Sure. Yeah. That's right. Now, Joe, I believe you've got lots and lots of stories that you know and you can tell. Way too many. Yeah. How... (laughs) I heard a little bird told me. Here comes the bird. There's one about a Wing Commander press release uh-huh. in Austin on Richard's property about a helicopter and cosplay. Does that ring any bells? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> All right. Here's, Please share. Here's, this is a good story. Good. All right. Uh, Richard was uh, working with Destination Games for NCSoft, yes. and they were doing the game Tabula Rasa. Okay. Well, they uh, invited a bunch of press, and luckily, me too, uh, to get to go to this event that they were having, this Tabula Rasa event. And uh, they, they got us all together, they invited us to get on a bus to actually go and do a tour of Richard Garriott's house and see the game and like that. But what many people did not realize was that he was incorporating game aspects into this little quote unquote press junket to where we're waiting to get on the bus and there is a man that's walking around that looks very shifty and, uh, you eventually figure out that he is part of the game and he's trying to give you clues as to what's going to happen. So we end up going to Garriott's house and there are people that are there and it was basically a type of a magic uh, event where they had magicians and uh, Egyptian uh, fakirs and things like that that were showing their talents and skills in magic. But the connection finally came when you suddenly realized that what they were actually doing, quote unquote, as part of the fun, was that not only were they just showing you interesting magic tricks, they were trying to scout out who had magic potential inside their DNA, which was the basis of the game itself that there are people that have magic in their DNA and can actually cast spells, but we've just lost the ability. So they were trying to figure out who actually had it and then brought people up on stage on Garriott's old property, on his new property. He's building Britannia Manor Mark (laughs) Three. So the bus drove us out there to the foundations of this building. And they're saying, oh, here are some of the things that we... uh, that we dug up while we were digging Garriott's house, while we were digging for the foundations. And one is this giant steel ball. And they brought people up on this makeshift stage and they said, the reason that we brought you all here was not to give you a magic show in Richard's regular house, but to determine who had the psychic ability to be able to cast spells using your hands, which was the premise of Tabula Rasa. We found this ball and we want to have everybody come up one at a time and touch this ball to find out if you have that magical ability. Well, what nobody realized was that it was hooked to a giant Tesla coil behind the scenes. 
So some people were touching the ball and nothing would happen and they'd say thank you very, very much. And then they picked one person that they turned the Tesla coil on unbeknownst to everyone. And this huge spark jumped from the ball to their hand. And they said, oh, you have this magic ability. Well, after that, all hell breaks loose. Meaning that out of nowhere, the entire audience gets invaded by these space people from the Tabula Rasa world. And they had people in costumes of alien costumes with M16s. And they had <laughs> Rebel Alliance people come out of nowhere with their machine guns. <laughs> and there's a battle going on in front of the press junket who's all s standing in this uh, white plastic lean-to type of thing. And we didn't realize that we had been cordoned off so that this choreographed thing would go on. There are explosions happening everywhere. Fireworks going off, giant lights, sound, all kinds of stuff. Then the top of this lean-to actually rips off and a gigantic spacecraft comes down within 25 feet of everyone's head with lights and rotating flashing noises and everything because they actually got Richard Garriott's brother, Robert Garriott, who is an aircraft enthusiast, to fly a helicopter with an attachment on the bottom of it to look like a <laughs> spacecraft, fly over everyone's head. It became complete and utter chaos, you know? And we were in the middle of this Hollywood-esque movie production and didn't realize it. It's like, holy mackerel, what the heck is going on, you know? And the rebels drive back the aliens and the explosions are going off all around you. And they had choreographed this thing perfectly. And it was one of the most amazing events that I had ever been to. And nobody wrote about it. Really? They talked about the food. What? I mean, it was it was the biggest heartbreak that I had ever seen. I remember walking away from that with my head spinning going, how on earth could any game developer ever top this idea? And no one wrote about it. I was just blown away, you know? Uh, you uh, and they, they, down, they got down to the point that they said, we're while digging the foundations for Richard Garriott's Britannia Manor Mark III, we came across some of these artifacts that were underground and blah, blah, blah. And there is a Tyrannosaurus Rex skull there. Now, you would say that's neat in and of itself. But yeah. if you are me, who is the avid ravenous Garriott fan and collector, you realize that Richard Garriott is the owner of one of only two genuine Tyrannosaurus Rex skulls on the planet Earth. A lot of people don't realize that there were only two that were ever found ever full T-Rex skulls. Everyone that you've seen in the museums is a cast of one of those two. Now, Richard, Good. being the guy that he is, he said, I have to have a real one. And he bought it. It's a Sotheby's auction or a Christie's auction or something like that. So he is one of the people that has one of the two ever found on Earth. They found a lot of pieces, but they've never found a whole one except for two. And he had his people lug it down to the foundations of his house and lay it on the ground so that people could look at it. So a lot of people walked by and went, hey, cool, Tyrannosaurus Rex skull, that's fun. And it was just this offhanded thing. But to me, I go, that's the yeah. real one, you, you know? It? Yeah, and it was just, you know, and, 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 and I'm dying to touch the thing, but I don't dare go near it, of course. But Richard's that kind of guy that, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, if you're a Beatles fan, one of the coolest things that I love is that, you know, there's Paul McCartney's classic 1962, you know, Hofner violin bass, that iconic image of the Beatles, you know? Yeah. And I've heard stories that people go, it's right here. That's the one. And Paul will toss it in your lap and go, here you go. Take a look at it. And you go, really? This is amazing. Richard's that kind of guy. It's not about, you know... I am the collector extraordinaire, and it's not that he his 
his collections and his passions are not set up like the Louvre, where you have a, a, a you know, a, a, a satin or velvet rope in front of the Mona Lisa. Mm. He will let you come up and go, oh, you appreciate it? Get your hands on the thing. I didn't dare ask, but I'll bet if I had, he would have appreciated my passion and probably let me go over and touch it, you know? So it's, so it's that kind of thing. He's just a regular guy who loves sharing his passion with people. And right. That's exactly it. And there aren't many of those people left. What I love is that he is that image of the true eccentric and yeah. still appreciates other people. These people don't exist anymore. A lot of people fob themselves off as a true eccentric. You know what I mean? You hear all those stories about, you know, what's his name? Charlie Sheen. You know, mm. when he does all the crazy bits. But that's all for the camera. Richard truly is that guy who has his passions and has his fingers in so many things. Like archaeology. Like space travel. Like uh, magic. I mean, a lot of people don't mm. realize that Gary it is, you know, an official magician that is is directly related to the Society of American Magicians. You know, that, that you know Harry Houdini started and all that stuff. And he has friends who are true professionals, you know? And I love the fact that his passions really fall into that automata, stuff like that. And he is, he is that classic Renaissance man. And he loves being that guy. And he doesn't really care if people haven't put him on a pedestal as a Da Vinci, you know? I'll just, I'm just doing my thing. And that's what I appreciate more than anything about him. Yeah. I think that's a wonderful testament, and it's a fantastic thing to be able to say about anybody. That's glorious to be doing it in your own right, just because you love doing it, and not because you feel you're important. And being able to share those passions, and you brought up that yeah. he's a regular guy. Uh, we actually got to go to, he actually visited Washington, D.C. once to talk about when he was going on his space travel before he went. Yeah. And we went to the meeting. We, we got to go, and it was in a college campus, and it was in one of those large lecture halls where the seats go up forever. And he gave his yeah. lecture. It was wonderful. And then he said, you know, for the fans... I know this is not about Ultima, but I know there are a lot of Ultima people in the audience. We're going to go around the corner to the corner bar, if you don't mind. And I'll do autographs and talk to people and shake hands with the fans. And we'll have a little fan meet. And all these people went over there. What I wow. thought was amazing is that I got to go with them. you know. And so there's 75 people that all descended upon this little pub in Washington. And it was really neat that... My wife and I worked very, very hard to not be, quote-unquote, those people, you know? Nah. Yeah. Because now he's surrounded by every single guy who's climbing on him, going, Richard, Gary, you are my favorite, you know, video game author, and, you know, and they're asking him all these questions, and, and, it, was, and it was wonderful, and he got into that and everything. But Paul and I pulled ourselves away and basically went over into a corner and got a booth and yeah. went, okay, we're not going to be those folks. We're going to leave them alone and like that. Hmm. But we're watching across the room. And he's about 30 yards away. And he says, look, I'm going to go get a beer. And I'll be back in just a minute. And we're hearing all this as he's over there. And he says, uh, just give me just a minute. And let me go get a beer. And then I'll come back and talk to you guys. So give me five minutes to like get my bearings and all that. And then we'll come back and do an autograph session like that. And everybody agrees. And he turns and makes a beeline right toward Paula and I and sat down at the table and I was unbelievably honored that he he thought I I, I like to think that he thought to himself these guys are not the crazy fans he felt comfortable enough that he came over to us to get away from wow. you know the ravenous fans and I was so proud of my wife that she said what are you having Richard uh, oh, I'll have, I'll have a beer. And we got to buy Richard a beer, which was really great. And he spent five minutes with us and he felt relaxed and basically said, oh, I guess I have to get back to work if you'll excuse me. And it was wonderful, you know? Wow. Awesome experience. Yeah. I mean, it, it's that one. I've been blessed with having 
three or four once in a lifetime experiences. And as David can attest to, yeah. one of the most wonderful was the one that was given to me, I like to think, as a gift from Joseph Toshlog, the uh, Heart of Britannia founder. Yeah. That without my knowledge, he set it up that I inadvertently told him offline once that one of my biggest dreams is to actually make a video game trade with Richard and he set the whole thing up without my knowledge and it was absolutely fantastic that Richard got online with all of the rest of Joseph's heart the Britannia people and actually proposed a trade with me and I got to give him something and he got to give me something and it's like and the wonderfulness is that everybody in that group understood and got how excited I was and the passion behind it and how gracious Richard was over this. And it was so neat to see everybody physically cheer once the transaction was completed. And yep. it was, you know what I mean? The, the yeah. heartfelt sentiment in that little group. And of course, Joseph had the foresight to be recording the entire thing. And it's out on YouTube. And it's so wonderful to hear all these passionate Ultima people see Richard do something so magnanimous for one of the fans and everybody went, yay, you know, Joe, Joe well, got his dream, you know, it was wonderful. I can't There were think. multiple things he's actually done for you too, Joe, if you remember, he, he still like the center of his, uh, one of his, one of the centerpieces of his collection is this thing, is the thing you made, the, uh, reagents. Yes. Wasn't it? Yes, it was. That's another story. Do we have time? We have all the time you want, mate. <laughs> I did. I didn't know you knew about that, David. Uh, uh, it was brought up once. I remember all things about you, man. Oh, wonderful! One of the things that we did, and I think, I think, uh, uh, a sleepyish, you'll appreciate this. Uh, my wife came up with this idea just for fun. We were talking, and she came up with the idea of. Do all of the Ultima agent reagents in the games actually exist? Are they real? Mm -hmm. And I say, yeah, of course they're real. There's garlic and ginseng. And she says, well, what about like blood moss and, and mandrake root and that kind of stuff? And I'm like, well, I don't know. So we went and started looking all this stuff up. And as a result, Paula and I managed to find a sample of every single real world reagent that appears in the Ultima games. And we made a reagent box, a little 19th century scientific looking thing where each reagent is on its own little red velvet stand. Yeah. It's with uh, uh with like brass wire holding it down on each one so it looks very 19th century like a museum piece and they covered the whole thing in glass and used uh put little brass plaques underneath each one labeling each one of the reagents in ultima runic of course of course and we presented it to richard he would have loved that and he and i thought it was neat but I just assumed that he would he gets gifts from all the fans and it's like, oh thank you very much and blah blah blah. And he was very gracious and said thank you and it was terrific and I got to give this to him. Hmm. And I just assumed it was gonna end up, you know, in the back of the, of a closet somewhere or something like that. But to my shock and awe, when his house actually went up for sale in Texas, they're showing pictures of the house and on the mantelpiece <laughs> is the reagent box that I gave him. He liked it enough mm. that he not only proudly displayed it, but he didn't even take it down to take pictures of his house, which was up for sale. Wow. And I'm like, this is amazing. But yeah, the yeah. pants... It was that, that that's, special to him. Right. The yeah. pants that that little uh, uh, reagent box brought us down, the adventure for me is not really about the having anymore. It got to be like Pokemon at first. It was like, gotta catch them all. I have mm. to get games i have mm -hmm. to possess the things but now it's about the stories behind them and the paths that it takes you to yeah. which you know joden can definitely attest to meeting all those new friends in indiana was a wonderful adventure wasn't it oh it was great that's what i mean 
And it's all due to Ultima. It's all due to Richard. Even though he wasn't there, it's that fun. Uh, uh, one of the hardest ones we were finding was we, I was looking for Blood Moss, for example. Well, Blood yeah, Moss, that up right now. On the internet, <laughs> and it's not even on the internet. Nobody knows what it is. What is Blood Moss? Luckily, I live uh, within, you know, a, 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 within 10 miles of Washington, D.C. So I have access to some of the world's greatest, you know, scientists and people. So I naturally went over to the uh, Museum of Smithsonian Museum of Natural History and set up an appointment with one of the botanists there. Yeah. Said, I'd like to talk to you about blood moss, you know. And we went and looked in all these file drawers and all this other stuff up in the dusty attic with a dusty scientist trying to find references to blood moss. We couldn't find anything. And as the man's apologizing to me, another dusty scientist is leaving for the day and he's putting his coat on. And he says, hey, Bill, um, do you know what blood moss is? And the guy's putting his coat on and he says, oh, you mean sphagnum moss. And he walks away. So both of us look at each other and then we chase the man down. And go, well, what are you talking about? And he says, oh, a lot of people don't know this, but in medieval times, sphagnum moss was used as a way to uh, clot blood during uh, medieval jousting tournaments. One, because it was an incredibly natural absorbent material, and it is one of the few items on the planet Earth that is naturally antiseptic. They didn't know that back then, but they were trying a bunch of different things, and they found out that sphagnum moss, when you hold it against the wound, it doesn't get infected. So whenever you got slammed on the jousting tournament, you know, and they broke the skin and you got blood, you stuff some sphagnum moss down into your plate armor, and that would pad the wound. It would also help heal the wound. You know, and like that. And that's why it got the moniker Blood Moss, because it soaked up the blood. Wow. And you can't find this on the internet. So how hard is sphagnum moss to get? So I went down to our <laughs> local home and garden shop and got some of that stuff that they put around the bottom of the tree and mounted that on a little plaque and like that. So the stories behind all these things... Were, was more of an adventure than presenting it to Richard. I had a ball putting it together, and I don't think I even got the opportunity to tell him about that. So that's another story that I'll get to share with him hopefully someday. You know, well, and hey, there were I, stories behind all the other ones too. You know, I mean, uh, when it came down to uh, 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 Mandrake Root, I found out that. The only place I could get it was from an occult shop. And guess what? Witches are the worst spammers in the entire world. I had to <laughs> abandon an email account because I bought some, you know, mandrake root on the internet. And they wouldn't leave me alone, you know? It's like, oh, it's time for our Christmas sale where you can buy pentagrams and goat's blood. I'm like, yeah, thanks very much. So, <laughs> It was really odd, you know. I had to literally get rid of an email account because of it. Oh, that's just so funny. <laughs> it's fantastic. Oh, look, that's wonderful when you're sharing all this stuff with us. That's um, I, I'm, I'm having a ball. And, and it's all due to Ultima and Origin and Richard and other people like yeah. you. Like it is. It, there is this mutual admiration and... It's so nice to find that there are other people in the world that think like me. Yeah. That's terrific. Just go ahead and kill everybody else on the for- on uh, PVP who thinks otherwise. <laughs> That's right. I'll leave that to you because I stink. It, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's so sad. My my call sign in other games is fodder, <laughs> specifically <laughs> because although I love the games, I'm not very good. Yeah. And I'm that guy. I mean, I had to walk away from UO because it was like, oh, you're alive. Bam, 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 you're dead. Oh, I'm alive well, again. Walk five steps, you're dead. You know? I got called noob more times than I can count, and it soured me to PvP. But once I realized my place in the world, which was to run over here to get people to chase me so that the ultimate goal could be reached, I understood how it worked. You know? Yeah. 
Hi, I'm an idiot. I'm nothing but cannon fodder. If I can lead you away, our team wins. Yeah, oh, nice. Jesus. I know my place. <laughs> um, so that's me. Well, uh, I'll, I'll do my damage time. to protect you. Right. But no, don't protect me. <laughs> let, me let me lead half of them away so that you can go get the, you know, so that you uh, can go see, get the prize. No, no, no. See, see, see. That's the thing. That's, that's the horrible thing about Richard Garrett's game. Uh, games. As a young kid, they've influenced me to be more virtuous than I should when it comes to online games. I could, I could totally be a jerk and just like murder people, but I, I tend to. The terminology is PKKer, yeah. where I go out and I player kill the killers. Yes. I love you guys. I love you guys. So, <laughs> uh, but so, isn't that sorry. true that Richard Garriott's games? Pro- promoted that kind of virtuous noble thinking yeah it, and it sucks because i can't i can't stop it yeah. like it, it like 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 a perfect example that actually benefited me is actually kind of like a double-edged sword kind of because i became unvirtuous afterwards um uh the uh, in the game of age of conan uh there was this guy getting attacked by two people that were five levels higher than him and i was about 20 levels higher than those guys so i come up and unbeknownst to those two people just flat out killed them i beheaded one and yeah, killed yeah, the other yeah. and the guy he was so afraid you know he just went ahead and like started backpedaling like he's about to run away and i'm like calm down i'm gonna walk you back to town oh nice kind of a deal ended up he was a uh, very skilled uh, programmer of sorts and i'm a civil engineer i don't do programming and one of my classes involved programming going into visual basic and modifying the uh, the files in there and i kind of just you know kind of asked him hey wanna Want to do my final? So, <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of flipped. You know, I, I follow more of the, the valor than the justice. So, but you yeah. make these relationships, and that's the important thing. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you know, do you mind if I tell one more quick story? Please do. Just recently, only recently, uh, the unfortunate actually occurred where Electronic Arts closed the doors of Mythic Entertainment, who were the spiritual keepers of Ultima Online. Yep. And uh, it got subcontracted out to another company, and they closed the doors. Well, Mythic Entertainment headquartered literally 40 minutes away from me in Fairfax, Virginia, And it was a testament to the wonderfulness of the people in the Ultima community that they found out about this before I did. And when I finally saw it, I saw, oh, Mythic is closing. That's so sad. But what I did not realize is that one person in California and another Ultima fan in Canada both sent emails to the head people at Mythic Entertainment and said, look, we hear you're closing the doors and that's really sad and an era has passed, but if you're throwing away any old origin stuff, please contact Joe Garrity of the origin. (laughs) And make sure that this stuff gets preserved. And I didn't even know about it. So I got contacted by Jeff Skalski, you know, one of the lead producers at Mythic, and said, he said, come get this stuff. And they sent, they gave me boxes and boxes. And this is only recently. I mean, I'm glad I don't have, I'm glad this is not a video conference because the room is filled with cardboard boxes. It's it's horrible. I mean, the, the, the Origin Museum is an absolute mess now. But boxes and boxes of sealed games, original artwork, uh, I'm holding in my hands right now some of the original boards that were used to make the manuals for Ultima 5. The original master boards that they laid under a photographic machine and took a picture of to make the manuals. I have the originals. Wow. You know, I have, and, and it's a huge pile of, you know, of these sheets for every single one. I'm holding pages 28 and 29 in my hands right now. So you can see that, you know, Wandering Eyes and Warlock and Wraith from all of the, you know, this is the monster manual portion of it. And you can see that the Zorn, the original graphic, was probably not good enough. So they just 
tape the new graphic over top of it and you can actually see this one thing but i have the originals and i'm i'm planning preserving them and holding on to them you know because this is like the very first ones and i'm i'm honored that they thought of me and it got to the point where i just got another email saying hey there was another storage unit i got an email yesterday there was another storage unit that we forgot about and it was locked and we couldn't find the key and now that we opened it we found out that the actual head and the breastplate and the entire costume for the main enemy in wing commander three prince thrakath is in here do you want it and i'm like <laughs> heck yeah i want it you know and uh i'm going down next tuesday to get the costume you know and they're 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 giving that to me as one last wonderful goodwill gesture and i think it's amazing that you know this probably oh and the reason i'm telling you this is because when i went like i said i went once already and they gave me a bunch of stuff they just asked me to come down again and get more but when i went the first time mr skalski says i also want to show you something joe and he takes me into a back room and they're basically dismantling the office so it's like you know there's like ceiling tiles broken on the floor and empty tables and no more computers and you know it and it's a really kind of a uh, a, a bittersweet scene so he takes me in the back office and says this table which has three piles of stuff on it he says i want to make sure that you know that this stuff here is not for you that's <laughs> okay and he says because we're take we found some stuff that we feel this stuff should go to Richard Garriott this stuff should go to Chris Roberts the creator of Wing Commander and this stuff should go to the producer Warren Spector who did Ultima Underworld and you know and and those things and it just filled my heart with joy because I looked at Jeff and went you get it mm-hmm. you get it it's not about just giving it away to the fans it's realizing how important these pieces are to history and maybe having those little boats sail back to the originators as a gesture of goodwill that they go and i, and I was almost ready to cry because it's like somebody finally gets how important this stuff is because it was mailed to them from texas and then it made its way to California and then it made its way to Virginia. Oh, you're doing Ultima online? Here's some old Ultima stuff we don't need anymore. And they're just in old battered cardboard boxes and the heads at EA didn't get it. But Jeff Skalski, he gets it and says it needs to go to the fans and it need and some of the most important pieces need to go back to the originators. So I am eagerly anticipating Richard posting something hopefully on his facebook saying what a tremendous gift from electronic arts that they were kind enough to remember me and bring back some wonderful memories of my of my own history you know wow. and i'm really looking forward to seeing that so that's a nice little clue to the people who listen to this broadcast that they'll get hopefully they'll get to see that soon terrific that's fantastic what a story and look, I believe you've also been honoured, Joe, as one of the first recipients of the Order of the New Britannian Empire. I'm kind of sad that you brought that up, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> because I want my medal. They haven't sent me my medal yet. No. And I oh. have seen other. I have seen other soda fans. Yeah. You know, uh, 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 what's her name? Uh, Lori. Yep. She yeah, has her medal. Well, that's because we has went her there. Medal. It, and I was so I was now now of course I'm I'm joking around but I'm yeah. I thought it was a magnanimous gesture and I thought it was absolutely wonderful to see her get they and they videoed when they gave her yeah that's right I and, remember and it was yeah. terrific and I was incredibly honored and I want mine I want mine well, right see, now. no no see 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 that's the thing it, you and Sir Frank still have that passion it's just that he happened to go there and he was actually kind of cursing a little bit it's like give me my medal. The whole time, just like you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so there, there, there's some heavy passion with it. I'm, I'm only half joking. I mean, I got to be honest. I was brought almost to tears to see those people who are truly, genuinely deserving 
of being honored by that. And I was incredibly honored that he thought of me. But I have I have a paper cutout of the image of the medal hanging on my wall right now because I'm wow. like, so I mean I'm looking at it right now, going, I want my medal. Oh my god! <laughs> as, as a collector, you really need the medal itself. I know it'll come, but yeah. I'm still I'm like baiting breath, going, they're going to send yeah. you. Really again, again, everybody was kind of freaking out about it when we went over there because I think one of the main topics was when we met up with Joseph, both Lori and Frank were like, we're gonna get our medal right. We're gonna we're gonna get it right, it's, <laughs> right? It's so, so they were a little antsy. I, they weren't really pissed. It's just that they were they were I guess just just a whole bunch of bottled up emotions are tied up to those medals that they're kind of spazzing out a little bit. Yeah. So now, it was, it was, and, it was and, I, and I also thought this was a very good idea. You know uh, that you know, Joten, you can attest to this when when something goes wrong. And there's something that, and because I respect your opinions regarding soda and the mechanics and the balance and all that, when you find that one thing that you know needs to be changed and they won't change it, please let me know. And then just like John Lennon, I'll return my, my, my O-N-D-E in protest. You know? Uh, uh, it's a bit, <laughs> no, I mean, ultimately, actually, one of the key notes that I actually brought up with them one of the one of the key topics that they actually had uh, was why did uh, what the hell were they thinking uh, was actually the topic of uh, one of the panels um, <laughs> one of the thing one of the questions I brought up because uh, they were talking about yeah it's good you know we're we're away from publishers and stuff like that one of the questions I brought up and they kind of uh, they answered it but they kind of danced around it at the same time hmm. uh, but but they did give an answer um, was so you're away from the publishers from being the overlords how does it feel having the community being your overlords? Like, how can you tell them they're wrong? And, and how can I you believe... possibly answer a question like that without uh, well, no, no, no. the community? I, I know. I didn't want to put him in the spot like that, but it, the way he said it, and it makes sense, It's it's, and that's why I backed the game, was he says, ultimately, the final decision is theirs. It, it is the, it's the developers. It's the final decision is theirs. And uh, I'm glad to see that kind of backbone because on the forums it's been terrifying me like they don't fall to the whim of the forum community yeah you know they may offer some good suggestions I can offer some decent suggestions but for God's sake don't you know just follow your passion you know it's it just scares me sometimes that they're 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 instantly like switching a few things like I was actually I know a lot of people are upset because they did promise us during the Kickstarter uh, the uh, map the overall map uh, that they were promised or at least they were quote unquote you know quoted on saying that we're gonna make this uh you know slightly similar of graphical fidelity towards Civilization Four so when they actually brought up the map for the first time and it was a cloth map kind of a dealio a lot of people got up pissed and a lot of people got upset i was actually okay with it I, I even though yeah you know it's not what i expected it wasn't bad they were still working on it and it's something that they can manage now they're spending their resources on trying to make a completely 3d version of that and remember they doubled the size of the map yes they did so yeah, that's right. yeah so it's like yeah you know it's you know they, there were a lot of angry people on the forums but it's like was this the right thing to do? I mean, it is. It is their decision. It is their 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 decision. I can't judge them, but it's like they're they're weighing on whether or not they should have followed you know the cloth map or if they should have done the 3D model. I mean, I'm, I'll follow them whichever way they go. But uh, and it's just a lot of people know. And I think I can relate to that because I, I like your analogy about their decision being final because they know what they're doing. Um, I work with obstetricians a lot and often people will come in having a baby and they've got this wonderful birth plan written out. It might be six pages long and this is what they want and they want to do this, they want to do that and da 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 and that's all very fine and you can go along with that as long as everything's favourable, as long as everything works but if things start going pear-shaped at some point, the obstetrician has to say, look, this is not working. I've got the experience. We're going to do it my way. Right. Exactly. End of story. 
Exactly. But the, and but that's. The, yeah, but the sorry. spot in where we differ, David, is that never once, not even one time, did I ever emotionally panic that they were going to fall into the fan thing. I have uh-huh. always had 100% confidence going, these are seasoned vets. Yep. They're going to make the game, they're going to do the best they can and make the game the best way that they know how without using the influence. The community is there to give them good ideas, but I love yep. the fact that they are ultimately keeping the control for them, which is what they're supposed to do. But I've exactly. never faltered in my faith. And I feel a little bad that, you know, they put you through these little mini anxiety attacks. And it's like, I, it's like telling a, a person with poison ivy not to itch, but don't worry about it. You know? Yeah. They've got yeah. They've yeah. Never. I've never worried about it. Not even once. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I should definitely feel exactly the way you feel. But being on the forums, like, slightly lurking as much as I do, and the fact that they do call a couple people out and they do kind of point towards a few ideas that other people have been making, it just naturally, you know, scared me a little bit. But at the same time, again, it's there. They they know what they're doing. Exactly what you said. They are seasoned vets. So right. I should really just... Now, the sad part is that the reason you identify these things where you're making mistakes is because you are an experienced person and an intelligent person, and you can see through the stuff and go, well, that won't work because blah, blah, blah. But what makes me sad is that you have no faith in the seasoned intelligence of the soda developers. No, 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 I do. I do. It's just that no, when I was reading that this whole record. Now it's totally uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I do, I do. It's just that when I saw the change in the community being made, it's it, it, the fact that the change was made off of the voice of the community when I was perfectly fine with it is what got me worried. The fact that they actually did change the map because uh, of a decent amount of rambunctious people, like the fact that the action of the change actually occurred because of people complaining on the forums. That's but in the what got end, me they worried. ended up. They ended up making the change, but they did it in the right way. Yes, yes, yes. That's the thing. They did it in the right way. And I should, again, as you said, I should, you know, just leave it to them. They are seasoned developers. It's just, you know, I'm just... Whatever, man. You, like, you get to the core and you make me worried and I start to cry and panic. You lost faith in RG. No, I... You shut up, man. I talked to the man. No. No, oh, the only the only the only gripe I have is uh, I think I, I pissed off uh, Star once. I pissed I pissed him off uh, just a little bit because I had a friend of mine go on Monday, and I didn't go. But he uh, he he uh, mentioned the thing I I wanted to bug him with during during the uh, press conferences. Um, he kept on saying the game's going to be uh, pay to play, hmm. and he kept on saying it's going to be like the Guild Wars model. And I kept on staring at him. It's like, but pay to play means monthly. And I kind of went up to him. It's like, you mean buy to play, right? Because you just buy it once and you play it. Uh, well, when my friend Dalton uh, went up to the uh, conference on uh, Monday, he said pay to play again. And I messaged him, you should go up to him and say buy to play. And apparently he kind of like gave uh, my friend a flustered look. So, <laughs> yeah, that's. Oh, you can just deny any responsibility for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he knows you now. Uh, he did try to actually sneak up behind me and uh, stab me or something like that when I took a picture with uh, Richard. Here's a picture of it. <laughs> he actually tries to assassinate you in the photograph? No, 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 no. He didn't try to assassinate me, but he was uh, practicing his sneak skills. I love it. Yep. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah, I would so love to meet some of these people and attend some of these conferences that'd be an awesome experience but living in this part of the world the commute would be a killer (laughs) i I just think it's a magnificent privilege to hang out with you guys this is just wonderful don't let it slip away yeah absolutely just make i i if if i may be so bold to make a suggestion sure make the effort I, I guarantee it will be worth it. Okay. I hear you. Alrighty. Okay. Well, you know, I guess we're going to have to wind this up sometime. 
Uh, yeah. I, I could we'll go on really, forever. I could willingly be here all day, and it's just been so wonderful talking to you, hearing your stories, and that is absolutely brilliant. Um, but anyway, uh, a quick note to the community. You can help us make this a really good news program. If you see an item of news that's important or interesting, please let us know. We'd love to spread the word. So drop us a note at lordbaldrith at thecaverns.net, asclepius at thecaverns.net, or style at thecaverns.net. Now, the background music is Shroud of the Overture Part 1 by Stephen J. Goldman. Thanks to Sir Style Teckel for the technical and website work on the newscast, and thanks to Amber Rain for broadcasting the newscast on avatarsradio.com. So I'd like to say a special thanks to both of our awesome guests, Lord Jerton and Joe Garrity. Great privilege to have you both, and it was absolutely wonderful to talk with you. And I hope we have the opportunity to do it again. So thanks, guys. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So until next week, when we hope to catch you again, this is Asclepius with Echoes from the Caverns.